Method 4, inshallah. We're almost done actually, alhamdulillah. So the Qur'an, remember method 4 and 5 I've put together because they're very similar. This is all taken from a book called Tathbit Hujiyat Sunnah. I had my students summarize it. Don't worry, I didn't take the summary from that. I was not pleased so much with the summary. This is good, alhamdulillah. But I used it and I added more, inshallah. Uh, just in case some of my students are here, I don't know if they are. I need to not badmouth my students. But then that's what they had to do. They had to read the whole book and write a book summary as a class project. It's a really good book, as you can see, all of this stuff, right? So now, method four, the Qur'an preserves itself through the sunnah. So what are we going to discuss here? Does, does anyone remember? What we, we already discussed, the summary is, the Qur'an establishes sunnah, the authority of the sunnah. That's what we said. How does it do so? It says, obey the messenger. It also says that the sunnah is wahi. It also says that the sunnah is necessary to be an explanation of the Qur'an. That way we say, okay, the Qur'an is establishing the sunnah. Now, there's one more piece of the puzzle that's left. Who, who can tell me what that piece is? Anyone know? What is that last piece of the puzzle? Yes. How would you word that in a way that... That sounds kind of like very intricate, the permanence of the sunnah, like in a way that everyone could understand. Absolutely. So basically, what we discussed is some a munkir of hadith, a person who denies hadith, he can say, okay, great, I also say all of this. Quran is saying that the sunnah is something real, you have to follow it. But that's for the sahaba. 1400 years later, mm, I don't know anymore. I can't trust all of those guys in the chain. So we need to add on to that to complete the proof that no, the Quran also says it will be preserved. So now we're talking about preservation. The Qur'an talks about preservation. That's necessary. Otherwise, they can just like put all of that. We spend an hour and a half talking about stuff. It's like, all right, put it all to the side. I still don't accept it. So we need to talk about this point. And uh, we'll just uh, feature some ayahs uh, in, in that regard, inshallah. I wrote five verses. I'm not sure if it is actually five. Anyway, this is a verse that we already talked about. Surah An-Nisa, verse 59. Defer the matter of disputes to the messenger. And I actually kind of explained it there. But I'll do it again, inshallah. Like whatever I'm going to say here, I, I did already say that. Talking about preservation. I was supposed to keep it till here. I, I kind of forgot, did I, did I have this again later or not? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, I'm just, parap- I'm just doing my own translation. Obey Allah and obey the messenger and those who have authority over you. If you argue regarding some matter, right, some religious matter, then turn back to Allah and His Rasul. That is, if you believe in Allah in the last day, you would do such a thing. This is better for you. This is the best in terms of you know, your, your end result. It's better for you. So a few points. I'll repeat them. We already talked about it. Ati'u, this verb, which means obedience, is only used for Allah and His Rasul, not for those in charge of you. Which means Allah has a separate, independent obedience that you need to give. And Nabi Wasallam is also authoritative, independently. As for any other ruler over you, Muslim ruler, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, they can't come and start making their own rules. They have to follow Allah and His Rasul. As for Rasulullah Wasallam, if he tells you something, you, you do not ask him, where is it in the Qur'an? If Nabi Wasallam says something to you, you cannot say to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where is it in the Qur'an? If Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali or anyone else comes to you and he says something, you can say, where is it in the Qur'an or the Sunnah? That's why al is not repeated a third time. They're not independent. So that's one point. Right? So he is independent. Now the second part is what concerns us here at this point. If you argue regarding something, go back to Allah and His Rasul. So Allah is telling us to do something. He's telling you how to solve issues. How do you turn back to Allah if you are disputing something that's in the Qur'an already? Let's say you come across an ayah. And you're like, okay, what does this ayah mean? You and someone else is like, I think it means this. And he's like, I think it means that. So now you're, you're arguing about something. Allah says, if you argue about something, go back to Allah and His Rasul. How do I go back to Allah when I'm talking about what Allah already said? How do I get you know? How do I get the info from Allah now? You have to go to Rasulullah now. 
And this ayah is not for the Sahaba, it's for everyone. The, the Quran, if you take Quran as a book of Hidayah that's meant for humanity, Allah is not saying, oh, ya ayyuhal, ya ayyuhal Sahaba. He says, oh, you who believe. Which means everyone who will have Iman till Yawm al Qiyamah. You will always have this capability of going back to the Messenger. How can you have this capability 1400 years later going back to the Messenger if it's not preserved? Can, can you just conjure up Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No, you don't have power like that. You cannot just dream about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and ask him. Some people, they're so pious. But for you and I, Allah is telling us, Oh, you who believe, we have Iman, Alhamdulillah. He says, go back to the Messenger. That already implies that it is going to be preserved. That's the only way we can go back to the Messenger, if it's preserved. Right? So that's, uh, this also tells us that the sunnah is going to be preserved. Also, how do you turn to Allah regarding an issue that's not even in the Qur'an? What if you're disputing over something, a masala in Islam, that's not in the Qur'an? How do you turn to Allah? You have to go to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that also means it must be preserved for you to go back to it. And that is what we are saying, that the Qur'an and the Hadith are preserved. Right, so... Unless someone says the Quran was only meant for the Sahaba, then the, their Iman is in danger. Allahu Alam, if that person is Muslim. Now another thing. We already talked about the revelation of the Hikmah. There's another thing called the Dhikr. The revelation of the Dhikr. And these ayat will show you, inshallah, that Allah will preserve the Hadith as well. Almost done, inshallah. If I could extend a little bit, just a little bit more, inshallah. <clears throat> Is that a question or just an inshallah? Okay, inshallah. But man, that's just going to prolong it if there's a question. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hijr, verse number 9, He says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. We have sent down the remembrance ourselves. We sent down the dhikr and we ourselves will guard it. What is this the dhikr? Is it like, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar. Is that the dhikr? The dhikr means remembrance. What is the dhikr here? In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ We have never sent anyone before you except that they were men. They were just men like you. This ayah, the background of the ayah is that the mushrikeen, they were telling Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Oh, if Allah is sending you, why didn't he send an angel? Tell him to send an angel or a surah. We want to see a, a, a malaika. We want to see the malak. So Allah says, anytime I sent someone before you, Muhammad, they were all always men. I'm not going to send an angel now. I've always sent men. Nuhi ilayhim. And these uh, men that I have sent, I've given them wahi. I don't send malaika. And then Allah says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't know, Mushrikeen, Go ask the people who do know, the people of remembrance. This is the, what we're trying to discuss here. Ask the people of remembrance. Who are these people? Anyone know who the people of remembrance are? Yes? Meaning? Correct. The Jews and the Christians are Ahlu Dhikr, actually. Right? We use this ayah like, you can use certain ayahs out of context for certain things. There's a principle in tafsir. But this ayah is actually talking about go ask the Jews and the Christians if you're doubting. Allah is saying that go see if I have ever sent a malaika as a rasul. Harut and Marut were not uh, anbiya. Uh, I've always sent uh, men. Ask the Ahlu Dhikr. So what's the point of me bringing this ayah here? Dhikr, Ahlu Dhikr. Ahlu al-Kitab are called Ahlu Dhikr. So Dhikr means wahi. People of previous wahi, go ask them. That's Ahlu Dhikr. In the first ayah, Allah says, we have revealed the dhikr, meaning the wahi, and we will protect it. So Allah is saying, the dhikr means the same thing in these two ayahs. Dhikr is wahi. And you get that dalil from this ayah. The second ayah, dhikr means scripture. Not just Quran. Any kind of revelation Allah sent down is a dhikr. That's how it's used in the, in the, in the Quran. Allah doesn't talk about saying, la ilaha illallah hundred times as a dhikr. In the Quran, if you see dhikr, it means scripture, means revelation. Now, the point. You guys are like, oh, what is all this? Here's the point. 
بالبينات والزبور وأنزلنا إليك الذكر لتبين للناس ما نزل إليهم ولعلهم يتفكرون الله is saying previous أنبياء I sent them with clear signs, miracles and scriptures we have sent down the dhikr to you why did we send down the dhikr to you? so you can explain to the people what was already sent for them so that they may reflect in this ayah Allah is saying that anzalna we sent down from the skies a dhikr a scripture to you or a wahi to you Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is, what, what is this dhikr here? is it Quran? لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ So that through this dhikr that I sent to you, you can explain to them what has already been sent to them, which is Qur'an. So I'm sending to you another dhikr, which is the hadith, so that you can use that dhikr to explain the other dhikr, which is the Qur'an. And so that they may think about it and they can extract from that. Do you guys understand the dhikr? So first ayah Allah says, we have sent down dhikr, we're going to preserve it. Second ayah tells you what dhikr is. Dhikr is scripture, is wahi. So basically first ayah is saying that we sent down wahi, we're going to preserve it. The third ayah tells us that Allah is telling Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I gave you wahi so you can explain the Qur'an. So is that wahi that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received to explain the Qur'an? Is it Qur'an? No. It's something else. And then tie it up back with the first ayah that Allah says we reveal the dhikr and we will preserve it. We'll also reveal the hadith and we'll preserve the hadith. You can use the first ayah like that. It's not just Qur'an. It's all wahi. We have revealed wahi and we will preserve the wahi. Which means the hadith as well. And Allah will preserve the hadith through individuals. Allah, it's still the preservation of Allah. He does it through people. Bukhari is someone that Allah created for this purpose. Imam Tirmidhi, all these imams, they were created for the preservation. Allah preserves through people. One more ayah, inshallah. And then we will finish, inshallah. Then I have a little bonus for you guys. The victorious religion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Tawbah, يُرِيدُونَ أَن يُطْفِئُوا نُورَ اللَّهِ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ وَيَأْبَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا أَيُتِمَ نُورَهُ وَلَوْ كَرِيَ الْكَافِرُونَ هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى دِينِ كُلِّهِ وَلَوْ كَرِيَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ I'll just, you guys can follow the translation, but I like to just translate myself, it's easier. Sometimes this translation, they confuse me. They want to extinguish the light of Allah through their mouths, their statements, the kuffar. And Allah refuses except that His nur and His light is complete. Even if the kuffar don't like it, Allah will complete His message. He is the one that sent His Rasul with guidance and the true deen so that it may be victorious over all other religions, even if the mushriks don't like it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here that Islam is victorious. No matter what the situation is going to be, academically, intellectually, spiritually, in every facet, Islam is victorious. And Allah has made it such. Now the question is, so this is talking about the victory of Islam. How can you, uh, Allah is saying that Islam is going to be victorious over all other religions. If Islam falls prey to the same things that have occurred to other religions, how will it be victorious over them? What does that mean? What was the issue with previous religions? Anyone know? Well, like uh, Judaism, Christianity, what happened? They, they changed their books. Tahrif in Arabic. Alteration. So if Allah is saying Islam will overcome everything else, is it through the same means that whatever happened to them, Islam is going to overcome them? No. Islam will overcome them because Islam has a system that they failed to create. Islam has a system of preservation. And that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defeats all other religions through Islam. It is pristine. Whatever the Nabi got, we have still today. This completion of deen cannot occur if you know, the, the hadith is, is not preserved. That's what happened to them. They didn't preserve their books and they got destroyed. So... If we fall into the same issue as them, meaning tahrif and changing our books, then we are not going to preserve the deen. Okay. Fine, we're done, inshallah, alhamdulillah. Right? So you guys can take a deep breath. Look at the chart, see if you understand. So, establishment of sunnah. Quran, tawatur, ijma, we're not talking about those two. We're talking about through the Quran, how can we establish the sunnah? We have two ways we do this. Number one, we show that the Quran says you must follow the sunnah. 
And number two, it's not restricted to the Sahaba. Still today, you must do so. Those are the two foundations. The Quran talks about following the Sunnah. It proves it in three ways. There's a verse talking about you must obey Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's more than that, but we cited one. There's other verses that show you that Sunnah is wahi from Allah. And there's also a uh, verse or verses that explains that the Sunnah is, an, is necessary to explain the Quran. And if Quran is supposed to stay here, that's going to the next point, that it's preserved. If the Quran is meant for us in future generations, we need the hadith because it explains the Quran. So the preservation of the sunnah is necessary because it entails the preservation of Quran. We cannot have the Quran preserved if the sunnah is not preserved. So that is this chart, inshallah. Hopefully that helps, inshallah. Now we're going to look at some things that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophesized. Some words from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the sunnah. These are a little bit crunched up because I put a few. I'm just going to read them inshallah. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, All my followers will enter paradise except those who refuse. The Sahaba said, Oh Allah's Messenger, who's going to refuse? He said, Whoever obeys me will enter Jannah and whoever disobeys me is the one who refuses. So he doesn't say Allah here. He says me. You obey me, you go to Jannah. You don't obey me, you go to Jahannam. Of course, the deniers of hadith, they don't deny this. But after all of this, and inshallah it should, make some sense. In another narration, he said, Avoid that which I forbid you to do, and do that which I command you to do, to the best of your capacity. Verily, the people before you went to their doom, because they had put too many questions to their prophets, and then disagreed with their teachings. So take whatever I give you. This is what is going to be salvation. Whoso obeys me, obeys God. Whoso disobeys me, disobeys God. If you obey Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi you obey Allah. If you disobey him, you disobey Allah. Whoso obeys my commander, obeys me. Whoso disobeys my commander, disobeys me. This is when he was sending out contingents. You have to obey the Amir. And this is a prophecy. Talking about these people. The Qur'aniyun. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Soon there will come a time that a man will be reclining on his pillow. And when one of my hadith is narrated, he will say, The book of Allah is sufficient between us and you. Whatever it states is permissible, we will take as permissible. Whatever it states as forbidden, we will take as forbidden. And then Nabi Sallallahu says, Verily, whatever the Messenger of Allah has forbidden is like that which Allah has forbidden. So he prophesizes in the future, there's going to be some guy leaning. It says, uh, he's, he's leaning on his butt, like, you know, just comfortably lying down. Meaning this guy is not going through any kind of sacrifice. He's living a, in the lap of luxury. And he has the audacity to say, when someone quotes a hadith to him, he says, No, nah, I got the Qur'an. If it's in the Qur'an, I'll follow it. If it's not, then I'm not going to follow it. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Caution, if I say something is haram, it's like Allah said it. And finally, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Let me not find one of you reclining on his couch when he hears something regarding me which I have commanded or forbidden. And saying, we do not know We've, what we found in Allah's book, we follow it. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, don't let me catch you saying this, leaning on your, your behind, and you saying something like this. You never struggled in your life. And you're saying, if someone tells you something is haram, you say, no, I only follow the Quran. He says, don't ever let me catch you doing that. And unfortunately, people are doing that. So this is a prophecy of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this would occur as well. But Alhamdulillah, we will talk about tomorrow, how the scholars have preserved the sunnah and stopped... Uh, or you know, prevented people from distorting it. So alhamdulillah, it is preserved. And this will be the subject of tomorrow's class, inshallah. We're going to be talking about some of the history of uh, the development of hadith, inshallah. And hopefully we get to finish it. There's plenty of things to talk about, especially regarding the sahaba. So I'll focus more on the sahaba and how they preserved the sunnah. And slowly a little bit talk about the imams and what they have done and the systems that were put into place to preserve the sunnah. Later on, we will, in next next month's program, inshallah, those of you who uh, come again, maybe some of you just uh, wanted to see how it is. Hopefully, I have uh, encouraged you to come for next month. If not, then I'm sorry. Um, but we'll talk specifically about imams there. So Imam Bukhari, Muslim, etc. We'll talk specifically there, who they were, their travels and all of that. But tomorrow is more of like a long lines of what the ulama did to preserve the sunnah. And then we go into the juicy part, or depends on what you really like, 
the nitty gritty mustalah, which is like absolute usul. Like if this was bothering you, then it's probably going to bother you a lot more when we talk about it. Like what are the conditions of sahih? Why? There's no stories involved there. It's just principles. Um, but this is our deen. If you want to get into the intricate aspects to understand how preserved our Islam is, then this is indispensable. So we're going to pause here. جزاكم الله خيرا وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى على خير خلق محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته